safe. Has anybody here ever walked into a situation hoping to be effective? You walk into the situation, you're like, I want to be effective, whatever it is. There's lots of different situations you could have walked into to try to be uh, effective, but maybe uh, as you attempt to assist in this situation, it proved to be a waste of time. Um, Maybe it was really a waste of time, or maybe it just seemed to be a waste of time. Maybe it was a problem at work. Maybe it was that some people needed help, so you decided to step in and try to assist, and, um, and uh, you, you're not quite sure what happened. Or maybe it's somebody that needed help, and you kept stepping in, and, you, and although you gave so much time and so much effort, and you wanted to be effective in their life, you wanted to see their life go a certain direction, nothing actually ever seemed to change. Maybe it was a test that you took, you, uh, you studied for, maybe you didn't study for. Some people don't study for things, and they walk into it assuming to be effective. Uh, but maybe you studied as well, and you went in, and you thought you were going to be effective, and you didn't study maybe the right material, or you didn't study well enough. Maybe it was a conversation you had. You walked into this knowing there was going to be a conversation, and you thought that you had all the right words to say, or you knew how to have... Um, had an effect on this conversation, and yet it didn't seem to actually pan out. Maybe you had an idea in your head. Ideas are always the best in your head, okay? Because once they start coming out, you're like, oh, there's more things to this idea than I thought. So once you, the idea comes out and then you try to implement it, it doesn't necessarily always work. Now, has anybody ever dealt with something like that? Yeah, all four of you? What about everybody else? Anybody else ever been ineffective in any way? Okay. There's a couple more honest people. Uh, These are some everyday situations where we were, or where we wanted to be more effective in these areas, and we just happened to not be. But ask yourself this question, ready? Will it even matter in eternity? Will it even matter in eternity? Some of these some of these situations that you get into where you're ineffective, that it's really not going to matter anyway. Whereas some places it may actually matter. I believe many people who say they believe in God or go to church or even some people who just try to be a good person are finding themselves less effective in the everyday life things, let alone things that matter the most. I'm here today to tell you that if you don't change the way you think about life, you will be eternally ineffective. Let's pray. Lord, as we go through life, uh, we realize that there's many times where uh, the outcome of a certain situation or something that we're doing doesn't end up being the way that we thought it could be. Um, And in ways we try to help the situations or people or uh, whatever else is happening in certain circumstances, and yet sometimes we just fall short of effectiveness, um, at least from what we can see. So Lord, as we dive into the scriptures today, I ask that you would help us to see what you're trying to say, help us to pull out what uh, the reasons why you're actually putting it in there, and help us to understand what that means for us. I pray, God, that you'd help me to say all the things that I meant to say here this morning, and that you stop me from saying anything I'm not called to say. Pray, God, that you'd anoint my ears to continue to hear you, and anoint my lips to speak your words, and anoint each person listening, uh, their ears, to be able to hear what your Spirit is saying to them. God, I pray for a great uh, anointing um, and a Spirit-filled message that you would have your way, God. Uh, We want you to do what you want to do, regardless of what that means for us. So here this morning, we submit to you to say, show us what's in your word so that we can act more like that. In your name, Jesus, amen. All right, still buckled? Let's do a quick recap. Since my recap is about three weeks ago, uh, not last week, not the week before that, but the week before that, we were in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, okay? And uh, basically, what you need to know about that message primarily, and you should really look into it, and this, the sermon title was called No Comparison. And uh, the, the, the no comparison is really that the suffering and the stuff that we deal with on this earth is nothing in comparison to the glory in which we will be able to be 
uh, in, with God, in eternal life, forever, in his presence. It has no comparison at all. The glory that uh, we see now is probably fractional compared to the glory that we will understand, know, and feel when we get into his presence for eternity um, in the heavenly. So uh, no matter what you're going through, no matter what... um, Uh, The suffering feels like no matter how bad it feels, the greatness of what you will be able to experience in his presence will overshadow that, I promise. And so, um, if that is true, uh, maybe we should consider that this world here is actually no comparison. Therefore, let's not put so much weight in it. So that's my quick recap So to dive into this morning, I'd just like to say, who has ever heard of the Apostle Paul? Raise your hand. Anybody ever heard of him? Um, Some people know who he is. Some people have heard him. Uh, Why do you think that we have heard about him before? Why do you think we have heard about him before? Well, the Apostle Paul uh, apparently has done things that have been meaningful for the Christian faith and... And what, what did he do, and why was he, um, why was he impactful, and why do we still know who he is today? There are a lot of people that have died 50 years ago, 100 years ago, or even 10 years ago that we have no idea who they are. But for some reason, a guy that lived 2,000, 1,900, 2,000 years ago is, is no longer around, and yet we still know about him. Clearly, he must have been impactful. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Apostle Paul in case you've heard his name but you don't know much about him. The Apostle Paul is known throughout history as a pioneer of the first century church, okay? The first century church, he, he did something that was meaningful in the first century that has impacted the church today. He shared with the Jews that the Messiah, that the law and the prophets told them about had actually already come. Uh, he shared that it was Jesus, Okay? At that same time, or around that same time, he went out into Gentile land to share that God sent the Messiah not only to the Jews, but for them too, which is the non-Jews. So yes, the Jews are God's chosen people, but God decided in his sovereignty to extend salvation not only to his people, but to Gentiles as well, which were his non-people, right? And so Paul understood this and knew this and started sharing the gospel. Not and What's the gospel? The gospel is, who is Jesus? Who is God? What did Jesus do for you? Uh, because you couldn't do it yourself. Um, and he shared that with everybody else because there was this promised Messiah. That promised Messiah came. His name was Jesus. He is the only way, the truth, and the life. And so he didn't decide to just share that to the Jews, but he also shared it to the non-Jews. Uh, can we be honest about this? We very well may be here because of the work, mindset, and obedience of Paul. That one man might be the reason why we are all sitting here, perhaps. It may be the reason why many of us are sitting here. So, I don't know if you would say it, but I, my, in my opinion, I would say that Paul was eternally effective. Is there anything we can learn from Paul in the scriptures that will help us be effective as well? Maybe, maybe not. But let's find out. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a bit about what the scriptures are doing, and we're also going to see kind of Paul's mindset on the way. Okay, so we're going to do, we're going to do a little double dipping here. Well, we're not just going to go over what's happening, but we're also going to go about what is Paul doing and what's happening in his head and his heart. And I hope that for us it will be helpful. All right, who's ready? All right, so we're going to start in verse 1 of chapter 5. Uh, Let's remember that this was a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. Remember that at this time there were some, uh, there were, there were a bit of issues that were happening between him and uh, the church at Corinth. There was, there was these ideas that um, Paul wasn't who he said he is, and he's not really that serious about God in the way that they thought he should be, and that he was really just trying to make a name for himself. So Paul's sending a letter, and this is part of the way he feels is like, hey, I'm not, that's not who I am, you know? And so he's just sharing not just that information, but he's sharing some other stuff. Later on in this chapter, he gets into a little bit more of, hey, we need to, we need to work this out. But we're not going to get quite there yet. 
So verse 1, for we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And so here Paul is just, he's just laying it out. He's saying, hey, um, we know that uh, if the tent that is our earthly home, a.k.a. this body, that's earthly, that may be built up but could be destroyed, right? If it is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul's saying, listen, what happens to me and my flesh and my body is not going to matter in the long run. In the long run, that is not what actually matters. In the long run, what actually matters is no matter what happens to this tent, God has made a building that was not made with hands alone. And that is the building that uh, we should be more focused on than this temporary tent. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think naturally we could say, practically we could say, we have groaned many times in this tent, right? Sometimes it's over a stubbed toe. Sometimes it's over your emotions or your feelings have gotten hurt. Sometimes it's because you lost somebody you care about. Maybe it's a friendship uh, stopped happening. Maybe there was like a... uh, you decided to not be friends anymore. Maybe it was a breakup. Maybe, maybe it was a, a, a car accident. Maybe it was all sorts of different stuff, right? And there is this pain. There's this groaning that we, that we take. But I don't think that's all that Paul is simply talking about. I think he's saying a little bit more than this. He's saying, for in this tent we groan longing to be put on our heavenly dwelling. See, this idea that Paul has, ready? Here's, here's the start of his mindset. Ready? He is considering and thinking that with, with, this, uh, with this temporary tent, uh, he's not even interested in fulfilling whatever this tent has to offer. He is, he is completely uh, invested into his eternal heavenly dwelling because he knows that that will not crumble. And you got to imagine, I mean, like, as a young person, you may know this, but once you get into your 30s, you start realizing it's crumbling faster than you thought it could. You start doing stuff that you thought you, that, that you would do when you were in your 20s, and then all of a sudden, it hurts more. You used to be able to pick up 100 pounds, now you pick up 12 and pull your back. It's just a different scenario. So we can feel that this temporary tent makes us groan. And so it's not just knowing that this is a bad investment, but really there's a better thing to invest because it wasn't made with hands and it is eternal. And so Paul is saying, we long to put on this heavenly dwelling because this heavenly dwelling is worth way more. This is a great investment. Then he says in verse 3, if indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Okay, what does this mean? Clothed, unclothed, naked, dressed, wardrobe, Chronicles of Narnia. What, what's going on? We don't really know what's going on. Okay, so here's the deal. Paul is saying that, listen, we can, we can, we can fashion this up, we can, we can get clothed well, we can do whatever, but like, we are really only focusing on this world then. Where is he saying, be further clothed in heavenly things. Clothe yourself with righteousness. Clothe yourself with eternal mindset. Clothe yourself with these ideas. Stop clothing yourself with something that's temporary that will only be destroyed. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in how we are clothing ourselves, not literally, right, but figuratively, how we're clothing ourselves in this temporary life. What type of car do we have? What type of house do we have? What type of clothes do we wear? What type of this and that? You know, like, does that really matter in the end? In 100 years from now, when you're not here anymore, how much will of that have mattered? You have to ask yourself that question. In 100 years from now, how much will it matter? Right? Sometimes we can ask in 10 years from now, how much will it matter? And we're really like, yeah, not much. Not much at all. It doesn't matter that much that my daughter spilled juice on the carpet. Didn't make me happy. But in the end, that's not my heavenly home, right? Now, this didn't actually happen. She didn't spill juice on the carpet, just saying. But I can understand how frustrating that could be. 
So we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, that, that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. It's interesting that he is saying what is mortal could be swallowed up by life. See, we think as life is this physical tent. And he's saying, no, actually, uh, real life is eternal, and therefore, if you are clothed and your mindset is pointed towards heaven and what God has for you and eternal things, this life will be swallowed up, meaning your earthly life. Because ultimately, what will it be swallowed up in? It'd be swallowed up in you, being, uh, you giving your, um, your attention to what is eternal and what actually matters. So what's the first mindset that Paul had? He lived like this life and his body was temporary. Okay? Let's keep going because we're going to see something else that he does. Verse 5. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. As a guarantee. So did you know, you, you, guys, you guys hear me talk about Matthew 28 a lot lately, because this is where God's been having me a lot. Um, Jesus leaves, and when he leaves, I probably said this like five times in five last sermons, but I'm just stuck here. Uh, Jesus leaves, and he says, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the Holy Spirit instead. It would be better for me to go. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, and uh, when you get the Holy Spirit, I want you to go out, and I want you to do everything that I taught you, and I want you to teach others to do the same, making disciples of all nations, okay? I'm paraphrasing, but that's, that's what he said, okay? So, so this Spirit came into our life, and then it says, uh, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. See, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a true believer, then you get the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. But what does guarantee mean? See, many of us are like, we're guaranteed we can do whatever we want in our life, and we're going to get there. I don't know if that's what it's saying. Let's, let's see. So the word guarantee from the Greek word is erabon, okay? So when we look at this word, it describes a partial payment or a deposit in which legally at this point transfers ownership to the guarantor. Okay, so if we're looking at a guarantee and we're saying that we're receiving a guarantee from God, what it is actually saying is he's giving us the Holy Spirit as a deposit, which, by the way, he wants to withdraw, Okay, And when you do that, when he gives you the, the uh, Spirit as a guarantee, you are transferring ownership. You are saying, this life is no longer mine. If you want to be, have the guarantee, there is a transfer of ownership. So what does that mean? I will say God is not simply promising or guaranteeing salvation to us. Uh, salvation comes with the transfer of ownership. Right? It's not just that, um, oh God, we believe you're, you're there, so you're guaranteed. Right? You actually, when, when you decide, uh, so in, in, ancient, in ancient times, ancient Israel, when you come under a rabbi, what you say is, I'm submitting to your way and your teachings. You know, the whole idea of baptism, baptism, originally a rabbi would baptize one of their followers and one of the people that would be their pupils, and what it's saying is, I'm coming under your teaching. And so when we get baptized under the name of Father God, Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit, we're saying, Lord, we're coming under your teaching. We're going to listen to what you have to say, and we're going to do that instead. Right? We, we have our own ideas. We have our own thoughts. But we're going to submit to your lordship, to your teaching, and to who you are. And so God is not simply promising salvation. He is looking for transfer of ownership in the promise of salvation. To truly give your life to God, ready? You give up your rights. This is like not okay, right? To, to, to truly live for God, you need to give up your rights. And we're all like, well, I want my rights. Just so you know, it's also his right to send you to hell, right? There is actually a good deal on the table. The deal is great. It's in your favor, but that means that you have to stop doing it your way. You let go of the wheel. You stop trying to control every single outcome. You trust God more than you trust yourself, and you give him permission to direct you, to change your mind, and to make you feel uncomfortable. You don't just say you surrender to God. You actually do it. 
We sing beautiful songs about I surrender, right? And it's like we can sing it, but can we do it, right? Um, it says in the Bible that uh, many, many, people, uh, many people will go to him and say, Lord, Lord, I cast demons out of your name. I, I heal people in your name. I, I shared who you were. I did all this stuff. And he says, he looks at them and he says, I never knew you. See, it's more than just using words. It's more than healing. It's more than casting demons out. It's more than miracles. Before Jesus was betrayed and taken to be killed, he said this to his disciples. He said, ready? And this is from Jesus, so I want you to listen. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. What is it worth? How, what could you trade for your soul? Would you be willing to have all the glory and honor and things in this world just to forfeit your soul? If you knew that that was actually on the table, I would assume you would say probably not. But the thing is, is we get so distracted and we get so caught up and we, and we get so like, uh, we start thinking about all this stuff that is less, less priority and it wraps up. Uh, our, our total mind and our mindset and our direction and what we think is important in life that we don't even consider the weight of our soul. I, uh, this is not part of my sermon, but I just want to be very clear. Distraction is one of the best tools that the enemy uses against you. We're super distracted. We're so distracted by everything. Everything is blown out of proportion. We... we uh, our attention spans are terrible. The things that we find interesting and that we spend our time on are ridiculous, really, most of the time. And honestly, what it comes down to is lack of self-control and discipline and understanding that this stuff is really actually not just there or entertaining us, but it's pulling us away from what's important. I'm not saying you can never be entertained, you know. We see, we see it in the Bible that there were, there were times for fun and being merry and enjoying and, and, and going to different games and even watching the Olympics or whatever. Like, we see some of that stuff happening, you know. But that's not our life. And ultimately, like, it doesn't matter who got gold and bronze in 100 years. It's not going to matter, right? We run for a different prize, Right? Okay, so what does Paul say very, the very next thing that Paul says? What, what is it? You ready? So, so let's, just, let's just backtrack a little bit here. So verse 5, he says, He who has uh, prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So he's talking about this guarantee. And he's saying, you know, like even uh, uh, another time he says like that, that, uh, that they're sealed. There's this idea of being sealed for the Lord. Right? That, that he's the one, like you belong completely, you're sealed to him, your, your, your soul is sealed to him, and he's sharing this. So, so if this is true, if there's this guarantee, if there's this transfer of ownership, if, if there's this sealing upon our, our spirits, what does he say next? You know, if that is the case, what does he say next? So, we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we are of good courage. See, this is what happens. If you believe and you know and you have a guarantee from the Lord, you, are, you become a person of good courage. Why? Because no matter what hits you in this world, no matter how hard it hits, no matter how emotional it makes you, no matter how much you want to break down, you have good courage because of what is going to happen in the end. You know that there's more to this life than that. 
You become of good courage because you're saying, listen, I understand I'm being hit hard. I understand that we, our bank account looks low. I understand that I'm in pain here. I understand that this friendship's not really working out. But I am of good courage because the Lord has sealed me. The Lord has given me a guarantee. There has already been this transfer of ownership. I am not mine anymore. So all these things that I feel shouldn't matter as much as what I'll get to feel and be a part of in eternity. I just think it's insane that Paul, out of all this suffering, you know, a lot of, a lot of 1 Corinthians, he's sharing his suffering. I've suffered for the gospel. I've suffered for Jesus. I've had a hard time. I've been persecuted. I've had trouble. You know, he starts out, the, he starts out 2 Corinthians that way. Read through chapter 1. He shares a little bit of some stuff that's troubling, right? So here he is, and, and all this stuff is hard, and he says, we are always of good courage. Yes, I'm being persecuted. Yes, I'm being beat. Yes, people are spitting on me, mocking me. Yes, I'm getting kicked out of city to city and city because they don't want me around. Yeah, that's happening. Like modern day, like they're egging my house, they're toilet papering me, and they're abusing me. But worse, I would say, right? We would think that's persecution. It's kind of a, kind of a joke in comparison to what Paul was dealing with. And yet he still says, always of good courage. Can you say the same? Can you say that no matter what's hitting you, how hard your times are, you could say, you know what, I'm, I'm always of good courage. I would say that most of us, if we are honest, would say, no, that's not me. But here Paul is saying that we are always of good courage. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't struggle or that things are not hard. I want to be clear. Paul shares that there's hardships. You know, he struggles too. But he's saying, in eternal mindset, I am always of good courage. Even though I suffer now, I am of good courage because what is to come? And then he continues, and I read this already, but we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes. He wants to just nail it in a little bit harder. He wants to just hammer it in a little bit more here. He says, yes, we are of good courage. In case you didn't hear me the first time, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. See, he says we walk by faith and not by sight. It's not by what we see or what we're dealing with or what's here in our physical eyes that we, uh, that we have courage from, but it's what is, which comes from faith and what is eternal. That's where we get the good courage from. And then he, and then he kind of like closes it a little bit. He says, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And he's like, honestly, I would rather be in his presence. I would. I understand that he has me here for a purpose at this time. I understand that I had to suffer for a while. I understand that this stuff isn't going great all the time, but he has me here for a purpose. I'm going to stay obedient. I'm going to do what he's calling me to do because I have great courage for what's to come. Lord, help me to be obedient here and now so that I can enjoy that eternity even more. So the second point is that you live from the perspective of promise. You have a guarantee. You have a promise. Do not live like everything's beating you up all the time and things are terrible. Live like God has promised me eternal life. He has promised me his presence. Anything that comes from this, anything that comes from this world is not going to compare. We're still talking about no comparison. There's still no comparison. We all suffer here. We all do. Some more than others, unfortunately. But we all suffer. And ultimately, we could still be of good courage for what is to come. Let's hop to verse 9. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Okay. Ready? Whether we are home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Whether we are at church or we're at home. Whether we're at church or we're at Aldi's. Well, I always pick on Aldi's. I don't know why. Because I go there. I don't know. I'd go there. Whether, it's, whether we're at our neighbor's house or we're, or we're inside our house. Whether our windows are open in our house or they're closed. Whether we're on the internet or we're not. Whether we're at work or we're not. We make it our aim to please him. Whether, whether we, we are coming into church and we can sense his presence or whether we're home and we sense no presence. Whether we're in, in, uh, in, um, in the grocery store or whether we're in prison. Whether we are in uh, walking around the city, or whether we're in the sticks. It doesn't matter. Wherever we are, we should make it our aim to please him. 
In every single moment, are we pleasing God? Can you ask yourself, in every moment, do I make it my aim to please God? Okay, so it's one question if you say, do you please God? Right? I think we all would say, no, we definitely fall short. You know, like, just to be honest, I know that I fall short in pleasing God at times. I wish I didn't. I want to please him. I desire to please him. I want to do it his way. I want to be obedient. That's the truth. But sometimes I still fall short of that. But do I, in each moment, make it my aim? In each moment of your life, do you make it your aim to please God? And if you don't and you make it more about yourself, then you haven't picked up your cross good enough. You kind of set it down for a second like, Lord, I don't really want to carry the cross right now. I know, uh, I know that the point of the cross is for me to eventually die all the way, and I'm not really interested in that. So right now I want to do it my way. Right? And that could be in a fits of rage. That could be in like you're frustrated. That could be at all these different times and you decide to not pick up your cross. That could be when you're sitting next to somebody and you know you're supposed to say something and you don't. That could be the way that you love the people around you. That could be the way that you love your neighbors. That could be the way that you interact with the people around you at all. In any space, right? Whether you're home or you're with the Lord, you aim. Some of us need to put better sights on our gun to aim better. Some of us need to put on some spiritual glasses. We're not aiming very well. We're kind of missing a bit, right? And if that's the case, Lord, help us to make it our aim to please you. Actually pray and ask him to help you. You know, sometimes we're like, oh, I'll just, I'll do my best today. I'll make it my aim. Why don't you bring him into that conversation? Lord, I want to make it my aim to please you better. I want, I want to actually make you happy. I want to think about you day in and day out. I want to think about you whether I'm in your presence or it feels like I'm not in your presence. I want to make it my aim to please you. So I think that's the biggest thing. I think the biggest thing when we think about, he says, whether we are home or whether we're with the Lord or we're home, we make it our aim to please him. Now, what does he mean by that? Has he been with the Lord before? You know, I know that he had some interactions with the Lord, right? But I feel like sometimes there's, there's places in our life where we feel like we're in his presence. We can sense his presence. It's strong. It's, it's, it feels awesome. It's like, yes, Lord, we feel you. We know you're here. We want to glory, glorify you. We want to honor your name. But then we walk out of that feeling, and then all of a sudden we start doing our own thing. I say don't do that. Whether you're in his presence or it feels like you're not in his presence, make it your aim to please him. You don't only please him because he makes you feel good about it. Let's go to verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, what, uh, if we translate the word all, what does it translate to? Unfortunately for us, it translates to all. Right? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Did you know that whether you like it or not, we're going to come before Jesus? We're going to come before God, and there's going to be this moment where we're going to be judged based off of Christ. Was he in our life or not? Was it something that we were surrendered to and we gave ownership over to or not? So we, we all come, we all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each person or each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, this is my opinion, but the Bible seems to share that we will be judged based off of two things when we die. Ready? Most people only talk about one. I want to talk about both of them. Um, uh, one of them is whether we believe in Jesus and are surrendered to God. That's the one. And if we do that, we have salvation. Right? There's salvation that comes from that. That's, that's, uh, that's amazing. The fact that you are saved by Jesus means you get to be in God's presence forever. That you, if you don't know that or you're not saved by Jesus, you haven't had that guarantee, you don't understand uh, how much joy and courage that gives to somebody who really gets it. There's nothing in this world that could happen to me that wouldn't take away the encouragement that I hold because I have a guarantee. But it says that this other thing, uh, here it says that uh, they will receive what is due for what has been done in body, whether good or evil. And I also believe the other thing that we'll be uh, judged for is how good and evil we did, or how much good and evil we did while we were on earth. 
You, you ever hear like uh, people say things about like they're storing up treasures in heaven? So like I believe that there is this aspect, and I believe it's a true biblical aspect where there's, uh, there's one thing that will be judged, like does, does Jesus cover our sins, you know? Uh, does, does he cover our sins? And that means, like, have we had the guarantee? Have we been surrendered to Jesus as Lord and Savior of our life? If that answer is yes, we gave our life to Jesus, then we'll be in God's presence forever. The other thing is, is how much good or evil did you do? What did you do with your talents that you had? What did you do with what, all that God gave you? Did you do something with it? Depending on what you did with the things that you have, right, because we're, we're not all given $7 million. Some of us are given two shekels. But what are we doing with our lives? What are we doing with the talents that we have? We're, we're, we're all not going to the Olympics, talking about the Olympics, but we have other skills and talents and personalities, and what are we doing? We all have different neighbors. What are we doing? And we'll be judged based off of that as well. And based off of that will probably be how much treasure we have in heaven or how, uh, how much more enjoyable heaven could probably be, perhaps. You know, I don't know if it's much more enjoyable or not. I'm not quite sure, but um, I'll be honest, when we get there, and uh, if I'm in like a shed and, you know, my neighbor's in like a, a mansion of some sort, I'm going to say, oh, they must have done a lot of good during that life. I want to go talk to my heavenly neighbor and be like, man, what'd you do? What did you participate in? So I believe that we will also be judged based off of how much good and evil we did. And that won't be for salvation purpose, more for treasure and what we'll be receiving in heaven. So, what does that mean to me? I think that many people claim God's salvation for themselves. They look for this guarantee. They look for uh, being sealed. That's, that's what interests them the most. And that's good. It's, it's, you, you, you need a Savior, so it's good to want a Savior. But then many people just kind of stop right there. The desire doesn't pass themselves. They want the guarantee for themselves, but that's it. Once they get the guarantee or they feel like they get the guarantee, they can kind of like shut off all engines and be like, we're good. I got salvation. I believe in Jesus. I'm going to surrender my life to him. And we kind of miss out on some other things. But this is my opinion. If you ask me, I would say this doesn't sound very Christ-like. You've just made it all about yourself, really. If we're going to be honest with each other this morning, if I can be honest with you, um, people that try to uh, obtain salvation and make it all about themselves and only try to receive uh, a heavenly dwelling themselves seem to not be completely Christ-like. See, Jesus came and he died for us. He made it about us, not himself. And when we, and when we realize that he died and we just take it all in ourselves and we just consume it ourselves, we're making it all about ourselves. Is there room for that in, in certain occasion where... Uh, we understand that God did do it for us, and so we're really excited about the salvation we received. I think so, yeah, but if that's what you just live on for the next 40 years, is that you've been sealed and you do nothing with it, what kind of investment is that? I think that you're like the one that took, took the talent and dug it in the ground and left it there. And then the investor came back and he said, what are you doing? And, and, and he said, oh, I put it in the ground. I have the same thing that you gave to me when you left. And he's like, you wicked servant, get out of here. We don't want to be a wicked servant, right? We don't want to make it all about just us and our salvation, right? There's more to it. What, in this particular instance, what was Paul's mindset? What was Paul's mindset when he understood the saving grace that was being extended to him from God? Did he have a mindset? Well, let's go to the next verse. Oh, we can't do that. There's, like a, there's a heading there. The heading was never written originally, okay? We put it in there to help us find it, okay? Let's go to verse 11 because I believe it fits in. Therefore, okay, so did you, hear, did you hear what he said before that? So whether we are at home uh, or away, we make it our aim to please him. This is verse 9, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due uh, for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, okay, here's verse 11. So because of what he just said, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Verse 12. 
Knowing that it matters what you do with what you've been given, we fear the Lord and we persuade others. See, Paul wasn't just like, oh, thank you, Lord, for the salvation. Thank you for knocking me off my high horse in the desert. Thank you for doing all that. I receive that. I receive that. And then he just ends there. Right? He says, now knowing that he holds eternity in his hands, I have the fear of the Lord. And because I have the fear of the Lord, because I believe that what he says matters, and I believe the scriptures that he has given mean something, and I believe that me being obedient to him is, is what I'm supposed to do, and because of all that, I persuade others. And then he says this, but regardless, irregardless, what we are is known to God, whether we do that or we don't whether we decide to do good or evil, whether we decide to say the right things or not, whether we do it in public and not private or we do it in private and not public, God knows who we are. And then he says, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. See, Paul is not saying simply, hey, uh, there's this thing that's happening and I've received it, and so do whatever you want with your life. You can see that there's this heart inside of him that says, like, I want you guys to get it. I want you to understand it. The reason why I've spent my, my, my life doing this and traveling and sharing the gospel with everyone is because I want to persuade others to understand the greatness of the grace that comes through Jesus' saving grace. I want to share that with people. I don't want to just keep it for myself. And so now we have to ask ourselves a question. Do we do that? Do we believe in his saving grace? Or do you kind of just sign it on the dotted line and like, well, I'm good enough for him to say, but those people aren't. They're too difficult. They're too hard to deal with. I don't want to talk to them. They smell funny. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord. So my, my, my quick question for you is, do you know the fear of the Lord? Do you have reverence for God? So what is the third mindset that I think that Paul had here? I believe that he would say, live your life in reverence of God and show others how to do the same. Live your life in reverence of God and help others to do the same or to show others how to do the same. I'll say there's a couple ways that you can do that. Okay, Number one is you can do it by your actions. If you act like Christians around other people, you're showing some of that, right? But what does a Christian actually mean? It doesn't mean that you just do all the right things and you, and you do all the do's and you don't do all the don'ts, right? You act like you're in full submission because you've already given over ownership and so you act like you're owned by God, not by yourself. So ask yourself this question. When you walk out in the world, when you do whatever you're doing, are you acting like you're owned by God? Are you acting like you own yourself? Or that you're owned by something else? Some of us walk around and we're owned by our phones. Some of us walk around and we're owned by YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. Some of us are owned by like five guys. It's the only thing that gives us any joy is the restaurant. I'm just saying, if we eat food in heaven, it's got to be, it's got to be great. I think they probably have a restaurant up there called 12 Guys. <sighs> so do you know the fear of the Lord? Do you walk in his reverence? Do you, do you show that he's the owner? When people start talking to you, do they look at you and you're like, oh, the title says Jesus? Or are they like, well, what's different? There's nothing different about them. They act just like me. In some ways, that's good. You can be relatable and things like that. But if you're no different than the world, that's not really enticing to the world. It makes nobody jealous. See, the reason why the Pharisees ended up getting jealous is because they actually had something that was unique. They had something of power. They had something of, of great difference. It made a difference. And so, therefore, they became jealous. Because here these Gentile people were, were, were having a relationship with God, and it made them jealous. We should be provoking the world to jealousy, not in a way of like, oh, look at me, but more like, I want what they have. They have something different. They have something unique. And when they get to that place, man, you got just knock that one out of the park. Go have a conversation. Talk to them. 
but you don't always know that that's happening because sometimes it happens in people's heads. Okay, all right. So this idea, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Are you persuading others? Is it even something that you're interested in doing? If you're not trying to persuade others, I wonder how much of the fear of the Lord that you have and how much of a guarantee you truly have transferred ownership, right? Because if we truly understand what Jesus has done for us, we should desire to have that for others. And here's the problem is I would say a majority of the people that attend church don't take that serious enough. Why did the church grow so fast and so rapidly in the first century? Because people cared about this. Not anymore. My church is my church. I don't want to invite anybody. I just want to be there and I want to show up. Uh, My God is my God. I don't want to invite anybody into talking with him. My family is my family and it's just can't invite them near my family because it's just me, my God, and my family. That's it. So I should wrap up, because if not, I'll preach for another 20 minutes. So I have three questions that I want to ask you, and I want you to write them down. I want you to really consider the answers. I want you to maybe type them in on your phone, do whatever you have to do to answer yourself. Ask yourself these questions, because to me, it's, it, this is serious stuff. Like 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the beginning of here, when we're talking about the guarantee, we're talking about being sealed by the Holy Spirit, we're talking about this transfer of ownership. I feel like so many people are so close, but not quite there. Like, you're like, Jesus is a great idea, and you would never say it this way. Jesus is a great idea, but I can't really, and I don't really want to do everything that he says that I should do. You need to transfer ownership. You need to actually pick up your cross and start walking towards him to die. That's actually what Christians should be doing. But instead, we're like, well, Jesus picked up the cross, and he walked with it. He died. And I'm great. Everything's wonderful. But we are supposed to pick up our cross follow him. The people that try to keep their life here are the ones that are going to lose it, and the people that are willing to lose their life for his sake will actually gain eternal life. Please don't miss it. This is not a joke. Here's your three questions. Question number one, how does your, how does your perspective need to change? How does your perspective need to change? Ready? Question number two. How do your actions need to change? How do your actions need to change? And question number three. I hope you guys are being honest with yourself. How will you work towards surrendering completely? How will you work towards surrendering completely? God's not interested in a lease. He's interested in ownership. God's not renting. He's purchasing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for the, the epistles that Paul wrote and um, all the scriptures that are in your word. We thank you in this moment that we get to just reflect on a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and um, how we can see his, his heart unwrap in what he feels like is important. And God, as, as we understand what was important to Paul and to see the great effectiveness that he had, I pray, God, that we would learn to equip some of those things onto ourselves, that we would clothe ourselves with these things. Lord, that we would be serious about uh, honoring you and holding your reverence. Lord, that we would actually transfer ownership to you to say, we no longer own this body, but you do. Have my life and do what you want with it. God, that we would hang on to this promise that you've given to us to say, uh, because we've given this promise, we want to give others this promise as well. Lord, we thank you for your seal, and we thank you for your guarantee. And God, I just pray that we would honor you in such a way that you would uh, shine down upon us, that you'd smile, that you'd be grateful. Lord, use us. Help us to be the vessels that you want us to be. Help us to be 
the new vessels that you want us to be to contain your Holy Spirit in this world. I ask, Lord, that you would teach us how to change our perspective, that you would share with us, even right now, give us downloads of actions that we need to take or that we need to change. I pray, God, that you would help us to surrender more completely to you and your will. Lord, we want you to have our lives. We want you to have it all. So help us to continue to realize how we can continue to give it to you. Every single day, each day, whether people are around or people aren't around, whether we're at church or we're at home or we're at the store or out walking, Lord, no matter where we are, I just pray, God, that it would be our aim to please you. So help us, Lord, because we want to. In your name, Jesus, amen. It is 9 out of 10 likely that we will continue in 2 Corinthians next week. Um, please really process this. If you need somebody to talk to, you need somebody to pray through stuff with, whatever you need, there's, I'm available, other people are available. Let's be serious about this eternal thing. If we want to be eternally effective, then let's stop doing things that create in us an eternal ineffectiveness.